this is a little blues junior that came in and the owner said it would lose all high end and sound weird after a while. And uh, I tested it for like an hour and a half. Could not replicate the problem. Uh, the owner got back in touch and said, oh, I found the problem with a different amp. It was the Wawa I was using. Never mind. And that can happen. Um, that's an important thing for guitarists to realize that when you suspect you have a problem with your rig, boil it down. If he had just plugged straight into this amp, he would have realized that the amp wasn't the, the cause of the issue. He had a, a funky Wawa uh, connection. Um, but this amp had uh, a couple other things. Uh, first of all, it had the hum that you saw me fix, hopefully you saw me fix in yesterday's video. If not, go back and watch Does Your Blues Junior Hum. Try this easy no solder fix. Uh, notice I use the wooden handle of a paintbrush now to move that uh, ribbon cable. The guy got onto me for saying you can use a pencil. I did say don't use the eraser end and, and don't use the graphite. I was thinking of a, you know, unsharpened pencil just using the yellow part of the wood. But maybe he's right. Don't stick anything that's potentially conductive at all, like the graphite tip of a pencil, or certainly the eraser end with that metal band. Uh, you'll have something in your house that is non-conductive that, that will work. It can be the, the uh, plastic handle of a small screwdriver just to move a ribbon cable around. But aside from that hum, which was caused by proximity of this blue primary connection on the output transformer, to these ribbon cables going to these output tubes. This amp had a, a, a lot of dust on it, which we will clean up before it goes back. That's just a matter of, of literally of dusting it. Um, it's got some scratchy volume and tone controls. Not bad. I've certainly heard worse. But this guy uses this amp in the pit orchestra of the local playhouse and it's mic'd and it's being fed to the big sound system. So if he were to adjust his volume, see it's better now that I've just been moving the pots around. If he was to adjust his volume and that little gets amplified through front of house, he's going to get some glares from the people who employ him. So I'm going to give those a, a clean up as well. There's just a little squirt of deoxid. But the other issue that these amps are very prone to is um, they eat EL84s alive. And it's because uh, Fender, when they designed this, and I use design loosely, did not read the data sheet for EL84s. They pretty much biased this thing as if it were cathode bias as opposed to fixed bias. So uh, that needs to be cooled off. So I'm gonna show this real little insert bit next where I, I cool off the bias, then we'll hear the thing. Okay, what we're looking for here are R51, which is a 33K, and R52, which is a 22K. And those two together make a voltage divider that sets at their junction the bias voltage, which is sent to the output tubes. Now, on the first three versions of the Blues Junior, that is uh, two negative. It make, uh, sorry, it's not, it's not negative enough. It, it's confusing talking about bias voltages in terms of it. If it gets more negative, the, the bias is, is cooler. If it gets less negative, the bias is hotter. We want to make that more negative and cool off the tubes a little bit. Move them from idling about 90% down to in the 50s. Um, now, some guys will take out R51 and put an adjustable trim pot there. And that's fine. It's a lot of work to do on a Blues Junior. Um, I'm going to take a note from the original Princeton from the 60s, the Princeton Reverb in Princeton, which just had a fixed resistor which set the bias in a sane range where most tubes would be just fine there. And that works really well for, the, for this. So instead of 33K, 22K, what we really want is 24K, 22K. So we want to change R51. Now, if this was one where I was pulling the board, I was going to do a recap, change the input jack, all the things I like to do on these, I would just replace this 33K with a 24K, no big deal. But aside from moving the ribbon cables to get rid of some hum, as you heard in yesterday's video, and I'm gonna give a couple of the scratchy pots a little squirt, this amp doesn't need any other work at this point. So I'm going to cool off the bias 
to prevent damage from happening at the output tube sockets and to make these uh, uh, electroharmonics EL84s have a shot at a longer life for the owner. So I'm not going to pull the board just to fix this one resistor. In this one case, I'm going to piggyback another resistor in parallel with this. So to get to about 24K, I've got a 33K that's in there now, and we're going to put in an 82K across it. And this is where it's a bit tricky to do on camera. I need to tighten that up a little bit so it'll fit. This is a half watt resistor. This is one of my half watt resistors. Mine are a little bit larger, which is a good thing. So I'm just going to kind of shape the leads so they'll fit where I want them to go. I'm doing this off camera, but you'll see what the shape is. And like that. Pardon me, the weather keeps changing by 30, 40 degrees every couple of days. And my sinuses are like, I don't know what to do. Let me get a little. This will work. I'm going to move that now. At each point down here. Now, I'm not a huge fan of piggybacking or tack soldering in general. But in this one instance, where I'm saving the owner a lot of labor, and I'm adding a very low mass component, I'm not going to strain this. I cut off the excess because I don't want them to touch the next resistor. Make sure these little bits don't float, end up floating inside the amp. Like it's right there underneath that lead. Ah, come on out. All right. Dirty secret. If you need to get a little piece of metal like this off a board, just lick your finger a little bit, and the piece will stick to your finger and come off. If that oogs you out, you can follow up with some alcohol. Um, all right, so I've got this piggyback resistor in there across it, and I know from doing my math that with parallel resistors, 82K and 33K gets you right about 24K. If, I'm sure someone will post the actual thing, and it's 23. 7589, it's at, or 24.34 or whatever. You can do the math unless you measure the, the resistance of the actual 33K and the actual 82K you're using. It's kind of meaningless. You're going to be around 24K, and it's going to be as accurate as sticking a 24K resistor in typically um, because of the, this capacitor in the bias circuit. It's hard to measure those caps, I'm sorry, those resistors in circuit. But then I just have a very hot soldering iron and I want to work fast because I want to join the new resistor to the old resistor, but I don't want to heat up the solder connections on the other side of the board because I don't want the original resistor to come loose. Now this should have a cool bias. It ends up usually being about 55% idle which is great. It's fine. People on the internet say 70%. Man, 70% is a hot bias. Well, that's great if you know that the wall voltage will never vary. And given how little screen grid protection these EL84s have to begin with, I like to cool that down even more. So 55 is, is a good place for a fender. Gives a nice, big, loud, clean sound. You're not going to be in cutoff. Uh, if the vo wall voltage goes up, it's going to go up to 60, 65% idle. It just kind of breathes, you know, it hangs with the wall voltage as it changes. Uh, this should be a much better place. So we'll check the uh, sound now that we've done this. Okay, let's see how it sounds now that the bias is sane. And um, I'm going to turn the reverb down. The reverb's really strong on these in stock form. I was watching a bunch of Alan Hines videos uh, last night, 
and over a coffee this morning, so I feel wholly inadequate to play guitar for the world. And if I try to do any uh, legato left-hand stretches that are beyond my first thing in the morning cold hands ability, I apologize in advance. most important thing I'm getting from those Alan Hines videos, and he's a, a brilliant, fluid player, is not just all the legato left-hand stuff that's just fluid and appears effortless, even though there's a lot of finger strength there. It's the right hand. His attack is so consistent and yet feather light. And I play a lot of acoustic, and I have a habit to go. <laughs> You know, to really dig in with my right hand, and I need to learn to be able to go and have that be consistent because every little note that I, I picked versus I pulled off or hammered on was a different level. It's like he's a, a, a fine dancer, and here I come in my clogs. But, uh, you know, it's good to, to listen to different styles and different players and see what they're doing. My right hand, I could either keep doing what I do for a living and, and work on all these amps, or I could sit down and uh, just spend a year doing nothing but working on my right hand. And uh, I think the mortgage company, et cetera, et cetera, I uh, would rather I continue doing this than I be a, quote, great guitarist. I'll just have to settle for good enough to show what the things sound like. But the amp really does sound nice. Now, there's a little bit of hum coming from the guitar, even with noise, noiseless pickups, you know, close to the transformer. If I rotate, it gets better and worse. <laughs> Very bright amp in stock form. It's got a bright cap across the volume that I prefer to snip on these. Um, it's got a lot of mids. It's a 25K pot, kind of like a Marshall. So if you want to get more of a Fender thing, bring the mids down. That's a treble at like three. Let's try down at two. As I bring the volume up, that, that bright cap's going to do less, then I can bring the treble up to keep it balanced. That's the special design Fender speaker there doesn't seem to like the lows too much either. To the guy who's telling me on the uh, Ignator um, uh, uh, Mesa video that I had the low end set too high. On both those amps, the bass pot was uh, a fraction of the value that you'd find in the actual Fender and Marshalls. And so the o'clock setting I was using, say if I had the bass at noon or one o'clock, that was actually pretty much equivalent to nine or 10 o'clock on an actual Fender or Marshall. But yeah, his point is very valid. A lot of guys uh, dial in way too much low end when they're playing by themselves and they get on a, in a band for the first time and they just disappear on stage. So it's something to be aware of. And I'm not saying, how dare you give me advice? I know everything. I, I certainly don't pretend to know everything. I know an awful, awful lot about amps and how they work. I obviously have got so much to learn about my my right hand and you know I've known my right hand most of my life you know you know especially close in high school 